Hello everybody. Um, good afternoon or good morning or uh, good evening depending on uh, which part of the world you're in. It's great to have you all joining us for uh, this next session of the e-dialogue on what future for small-scale farming. So on behalf of the Sustainable Development Solution Network, Foresight for Food, IFAD and APRA, thank you all for joining us. I'm Jim Woodhill and I'm the lead of the Foresight for Food initiative that's working to strengthen foresight and scenario capacities for food system transformation. Ken. Yeah, welcome. I'm uh, Ken Giller. I'm co-chair of SDSN's network on sustainable agriculture and food systems and one of your hosts today. So our network is specifically focused on SDG2, the zero hunger uh, SDG, with a strong interest then in rural households and, and smallholder farming. Jim. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Um, we'll do a little bit of a test and just uh, see where we've got people dialing in from today. So um, we'll put up a, a, a quick uh, question for you about where you're from. You can see it popping up there. And while you're filling that in, let me give you a little bit more background to the dialogue series. We started off back in July with an opening session that was then followed by local perspectives. And our last one at the end of October, we discussed regional perspectives and had uh, five really great sessions looking at the, at the diversity of small-scale agriculture across different regions. Today we want to explore transition pathways that are needed for small-scale farming households to both meet their income and nutritional requirements on a sustainable and, and resilient basis. We'll have a final wrap-up session at the, at the end of November. So against a, what's a wider background about transforming food systems, this e-dialogue aims to take a deeper look at both the opportunities and constraints faced by small-scale farmers. We of course know that small-scale agriculture is really critical to the livelihoods of many rural households, to feeding the world and to tackling poverty and malnutrition. Yet we also know that small-scale farmers are an incredibly diverse group of people, operating with all sorts of different land sizes, in different farm contexts, in very different contexts and cultures. And we are also seeing farming households have an increasingly diverse range of income sources that complement their farming. And we also know that many of the smallest farming houses really struggle with making a living income from their, from their farming activities. So what we'd like to do in today's discussion is unpack a little bit more, where does the whole idea of commercialization of small scale agriculture sit alongside a more nutrition sensitive um, self-consumption approach to agricultural production and along the role of what one might think about as more productive forms of social protection and perhaps how can all of those mechanisms come together in supporting a transition of farming households to a, a, a more prosperous and uh, nutritionally uh, beneficial situation. So um, with that with that context um, I can uh, go back and see how we're going with uh, the poll. Have we got some answers there? Okay, so uh, quite, a, quite a nice diversity here. Um, obviously the right time of the day in Europe, but a really good roll up from Africa and, and Asia as well, a little bit less from the, the Americas. But uh, thanks, thanks very much for that poll. It's nice to see uh, this bringing pe people together from right across the, across the world. Just to say that the outcomes of this uh, e-dialogue will be fed into the IFAD Rural Development Report for 2021, which is feeding into the Global Food System Summit. We'll also be trying to uh, take these results into the Global Food Security Conference later this year and writing up the stories that we hear. The sessions have been recorded and are also being made available as podcasts for those who would like to lift, uh, listen to them afterwards. So with that, Ken, over to you. Well, thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So we're really thrilled to have a really knowledgeable and experienced panel today uh, to share their thoughts from, from all over the world. Um, so we're looking for an informal discussion uh, the pan between the panelists and, and uh, around a number of questions that we've given them. But we're going to start with just a, a quick opening perspective from each uh, panelist, followed by then answering questions from you in the audience or a discussion among the, the panelists. And, we're starting off really with this question though, how do you see the roles of commercialization, of self-consumption, uh, of food, of, of social protection as integrated and complementary strategies for tackling poverty and poor nutrition that affects so many of these small-scale farming households? 
So first of all, Mario, over to you. If you could introduce yourself, maybe tell us where you are and, and give us a, a kickoff in terms of your own thoughts. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mario Herrero and I am a Chief Research Scientist of Agriculture and Food at CSIRO, which is the Australian National Research Agency. Uh, this is a topic very close to, to my heart. Uh, I think that it's, it's a, a topic very seldomly discussed in the future of food uh, activities, and it's, it's essential that we bring it to the fore. Um, what role for smallholders? It's, it's, it's a particularly big question, and it has many ramifications because smallholders are in different trajectories of evolution uh, in different parts of the world. In many cases, uh, they are incredibly important and provide the majority of, uh, of produce for urban and rural consumers, while in other places we see larger transformations uh, and uh, some consolidation of farms in some places. Certainly, uh, it is uh, in those places where they're still relevant, uh, it's probably a question of time before we see a, a range of more pervasive drivers evolving into, into their evolution. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in many cases, we have a lot of smallholders because you still have a, a, a relatively low opportunity cost of labor. And uh, that creates a relatively small incentive for farmers to actually change or to engage in other uh, avenues of, of work. Having said that, uh, most of the smallholders that, I, that I've uh, met in Africa have always had uh, an off-farm income source. And this is likely to, to increase in the future simply because education is changing the, the game. If you, many of, of the sons and daughters uh, of these farmers are very likely to engage in completely different activities. So there are issues around succession uh, in farming. So probably one, one of the key uh, issues that we see uh, as, as useful is, is the change of focus that has happened recently from producing kilocalories to uh, a more uh, nutrition-based uh, agenda presents unique opportunities for smallholders. Why? Because relatively, uh, relatively speaking, uh, smaller farms are, are very good for producing uh, these nutrient bombs present in vegetables, in fruits, uh, and in, in especially in small livestock. Uh, so these are opportunities uh, that that we we should actually think carefully. And, and when you think about it, the cereals and, and and the crops that you can actually mechanize are are a lot easier to produce in in other parts. So perhaps a, a nutrition sensitive agenda could be uh, used as a way of uh, improving the development opportunities for for smallholders. Obviously, this will require, uh, as we've said, uh, some commercialization, some opening markets of things that we know are deficient. Fruits and vegetables in many of the studies that have come up, up recently are, uh, are deficient. They're not enough. And it's partly a demand and supply issue because a lot of people say, well, it's prices. They're too expensive. Well, but if supply ramps up enough, uh, well, then, then the prices might actually come down uh, sufficiently for a range of urban and, and, and rural consumers. So we need, to, we need to think about this nutrition angle as an opportunity. Uh, the other thing that I would say is uh, probably there is a need for collective action as well. Uh, in in many, many of the farms are really too small and, and we really need to think how producers can actually join together to create and to incentivize those, those market forces. It won't happen in, in small villages. It, it needs to, to, we need to have a, a, a more broader, give a more broader opportunity for that market creation. Um, what else did I want to say? I'm, I'm sure that I'm almost there. 
in terms of you know in terms of social protection um i think it is essential that um what, what one of the best ways of, of, of social protection would be for these small holder farmers to be able to consume a nutrient-rich produce from their farms and this is something that uh you know in many ways we should treat them as the custodians of the nutrients in many ways sure. while the while the big staples might actually uh, come from well-established market sources <clears throat> now when you when one last point Ken. Uh, when when you talk to many of these farmers uh, in the field, they are still reluctant to get rid of their of their bit of maize or of their bit oh, of sure. rice for risk for risk issues. They still want to maintain a little bit of the cereal there, but there is certainly a, a real option to to think of re reconfiguring some of these farming systems uh, uh, to produce a uh, you know in, environmental, social, and nutrition goods. Uh, for the benefits yeah. of, of the farmers and the consumers. Thank you. Now, thanks very much for kicking us off, uh, Mario. And uh, I know several of the points that you've, you've picked up, I'm sure I'll come back with, uh, with some of our other speakers as we go through, but maybe let's go around and then we can come back to you with some questions. So Kwame, would you like to uh, go next? Um, thank you, Ken, and um, greetings, everyone. So my name is Fadis Kwame Yaboa. I'm an assistant professor of international development at Michigan State University, and also a non-resident fellow of Global Food and Agriculture with the Chicago Council and Global Affairs. So, um, and my, my, my work mainly looks at um, issues at the intersection of agriculture and food systems of transformation, and then um, how that intersects with youth livelihoods. So regarding the um, question about the role of those three processes that you have um, requested us to reflect on, uh, I, th I think it's increasingly been recognized that smallholders are not a monolithic group and that the diversity and the complexity of needs um, that is uh, both in space and in time requires a holistic approach to achieve any uh, food security, poverty alleviation, and resilient um, ob objectives. And on that, with that particular understanding, any attempt that integrates strategies like this is certainly a welcome uh, approach to addressing the issues that smallholders um, um, face. Because if you look at them even individually, uh, commercialization, self consumption social protection all have the potential to help smallholders address some of these various constraints that they face to achieving their food security and nutrition objectives. So commercialization um, has a prospect of integrating um, farmers into market uh, to sell some of the surplus that they have and increase purchasing power, which from a structured information perspective, that money could be recycled into the rural economy, which eventually creates a multiplier uh, effect that expand employment opportunity or farm sector helps some of those absorb labor, excess labor from the farming, and then allow those who are going to remain in farm to be able to consolidate land and eventually be able to earn incomes that is similar to what those in the off farm sector may also uh, be earning. Uh, in the context of self consumption, the, we know that with self consumption, smallholders are going to be less susceptible to market forces to meet their food security needs. We give them more greater control over their, um, their food security. And then social protection is also an important mechanism to address all the immediate uh, nutrition needs. And it could also be an important safety net against shocks and a vehicle which I believe could be used to promote adoption of uh, technologies. I think Mario talked about the uh, so, so sometimes the reluctance to adopt certain technologies, mainly because of the risk associated uh, with that. But if so, social protection could be a mechanism that guarantees that, look, if your maze do not do well, we have this safety net that will ensure that you are fit. But, but I think that it's, um, the, the key had always been with the implementation on how these are implemented uh, together. And um, we also need to be also keep in mind some of the underlying assumptions um, of these processes in relation to 
smallholder um, farmers. So, so for example, commercialization assumes that these farmers actually have surplus to sell. And we know that um, a number of smallholder farmers are actually net buyers of food uh, because they are, they are not able to produce enough and, uh, enough. and those who are able to produce enough do not have the storage capacity that will last them through the lean season. So they end up buying more food than they actually um, are able to sell. Self-consumption also will assume that they are producing the right mix of nutritious food, both in quantity and in quality. So, um, which may not necessarily be the case. And Mario talked about the emphasis on producing these grains instead of the vegetables and, and everything. And then with social protection, then we also um, have to think about the issues of targeting uh, as to do we, the, the, uh, uh, do we have a mechanism to clearly identify those that need it, need help, and then can we respond in a timely um, fashion? So I think understanding some of these constraints with the household dynamics, some of the constraints within the farm environment, and also constraints that they face uh, before market, after um, at the market level, and after market is going to be critical to how we actually integrate all of that. And I look forward to discussing these issues uh, in depth with you all. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Kwame. And, and I see people are already dropping uh, comments into the, uh, uh, the chat box. So please, uh, please do go ahead and, uh, and add there. Uh, you can actually make your comments open for everybody or just for the panelists. So don't feel shy and uh, communicate with everybody on the call. Iris, you're working then in a slightly different mode, I think. So over to you. Yes, thanks. Um, so my name is uh, Iris van der Velden. I'm the Director for Innovation and Insights. I'm working at IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, and I indeed have a bit of a different perspective uh, than uh, the two previous panelists. Um, so my organization is working together with the private sector to um, improve the sustainability of smallholder value chains. And we're doing that in three ways. So we're working together with the private and the public sector to um, convene uh, the sectors, the value chains that we're working in. So we're working both in cash crops as well as food crops. And what we're doing with them is to convene them around a sustainability and inclusivity agenda. Uh, we co-fund innovations, interventions on the ground. And what's important in our organization is that we actually gather the evidence and the learnings out of that to, to improve our interventions in the future. So with this pers perspective of working together with the private sector, I think you have put together right an interesting hypothesis of how commercialization, self-consumption and social protection come together. And if I look at this hypothesis from our experience, I, I'd like to share with you a couple of things on what we see happening in working directly with the private sector. So first of all, uh, with the private sector companies that we're, we're working with, so this is both in cocoa and coffee, but we're also working in, in rice, in maize, in, in vegetables. So it's quite a broad range of crops that we're active in. Um, so with those companies, what we see is that they have a huge need to uh, secure their supply. And in securing their supply, they have broadened their, their, their scope of looking at at their supplier base. And what we see is that they increasingly look at farmers, not only as suppliers, but also as clients of some of the services that they're providing. In working, in the companies working with those smallholder farmers, we see that they have an increased attention for uh, what often is referred to in, in our work to, to, to living income. So in, in improving the, the living conditions of farmers. And there, what we see is that they don't only look at uh, a living income from cocoa or from coffee, but there's increased awareness that those farms are very diversified as Mario indicated, right? And that farmers need uh, support for maybe their cash crop, but also for those other crops that may serve more a consumption purpose, as well as they need support for off-farm activities and for managing risks. So what we see is that an increased 
uh, attention for how to also support farmers in managing risks, whether that's through insurance for uh, insurance products, whether that's through different kind of buying agreements. What we also see is that uh, there's an increased uh, attention for human-centered design. So what Mario highlighted, right, farmers are not a homogeneous group. So there's an increased understanding that farmer segmentation and tailoring services and support to farmers is very helpful. Um, what we see is that the private sector can't do this alone, right? I think the public sector has a very crucial role to play here, both in making sure that there is, for example, infrastructure, but also the right regulatory policy. Uh, but also, for example, uh, when we work with companies on nutrition, what they can do is support farmers maybe with uh, uh, some inputs for, uh, for, 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 for vegetables, for example. But we also see that there's a big role to play for the public sector in promoting nutritious diets, right? Because we know it's not only a matter of availability of nutritious foods, yeah. it's also very much a matter of uh, 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 habits, right? And, and uh, what people are also culturally uh, uh, used, used uh, to do. Um, so one last thing is that um, we're looking with those companies how to best improve um, uh, farmer incomes and uh, what we see often is that the size of the farm is a, a, a very uh, um, in the drivers that we're looking at. So we're looking at price, we're looking at land size, we're looking at diversification, yield, cost of production. So how to tweak those drivers to work with farmers to improve their, their incomes. And then land size is often a dominant one. So I think it would be interesting in this conversation to, to talk more about land conservation. Absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Arius. I think you've touched a huge number of issues again as the other speakers and you, you're highlighting nutrition. So Namukolo, over to you. Uh, I think your speciality. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Uh, well, the need for poverty alleviation and nutrition are intertwined on the African continent, and it can be uh, a big engine for people to work their way out of uh, a poverty trap. However, this means that commercialization is actually a critical component of improving people's livelihoods, but it is not practical, nor is it desirable to actually expect them to eat only what they produce because contexts are so different and it would certainly not be the most efficient way of producing more food uh, to serve the nutritional needs of Africa's population. So what about niche food production, whether it, it be uh, specific uh, fruits and vegetables for own consumption, but with potential for market linkages? Social protection is definitely an important aspect of poverty alleviation, but only if structured properly to protect uh, food security and nutrition and the needs to uh, protect also productive uh, capacity in times of need. So social protection must be structured to put people back on their feet in, from crisis and to get them started towards improving uh, poverty so that they can still serve their nutrition need. For me, a good example of a structure for social protection that deals with both agriculture uh, production as well as nutrition is the Ethiopia Productive Safety Net Program. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is actually very clear from information that is emerging that it has been protective on food security needs as well as farm household expenditure on agriculture inputs, protecting the next harvest. So it is important that all these things, whether it's commercialization, improving agriculture production uh, in, and, and capacity uh, to produce the next uh, food, the next meals are actually addressed and they deserve adequate investment. But to be most effective, we must consider how the different pieces actually fit together in the big picture to avoid negative trade-offs. Uh, there must be enough investment so that smallholder farmers 
as they go about trying to provide for their nutritional needs, can actually also see openings for other livelihoods that they can get into. And for that, investments in the localities are required. Otherwise, we stifle their creativity and they are not able to uh, feed themselves, nor to look to other ways of improving their livelihoods. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Nankola. You, you've also been highlighting uh, social protection issues, and I think our next speaker, Fabio, this is really your speciality. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Yeah, everybody's talking about social protection now. Already. I'm glad to see, I'm glad, I'm glad to see that. <laughs> that was not the case, like, 20 years ago when I, I started my, my research on, on, on poverty and inequality. Um, but I think that, that from the social protection perspective, uh, I think the first thing we need to mention, and that it has been actually absent here, is that um, actually increasing coverage of social protections is one of the SDG targets, right? So target 1.3 1 .3 is basically to increase um, coverage of social protection, particularly among the poor and the vulnerable. So it's seen as a key strategy or a key component, component uh, to, to decrease or to eradicate extreme poverty in the world by 2030. But social protection also has links with the second SDG and actually with more than the second, but particularly with the second uh, to, fight, to fight hunger. So one aspect that we need to look at is actually what's the coverage of social protection um, in rural areas and um, from what, from what we know, and actually we don't have much systematized data on that, the coverage is quite low. So there is room to improve uh, social protection coverage uh, in rural areas, and not only social assistance, but also uh, social insurance. So basically when we are discussing agriculture and smallholder farmers, we are implicitly thinking around social assistance and social cash transfers. So we don't think much around the social insurance component not only for the workers in, in rural areas or the workers in agriculture, but also uh, for the smallholder farmers themselves. So I think that's one aspect that usually is missing on, the, on this discussion. So having said that, I can go back into the synergies and how social protection can be complementary to commercialization and also to increase uh, food security and nutrition. So basically we, we already have a huge body of evidence. So social protection, I think has been the dimension uh, that has been mostly evaluated recently um, with the whole uh, randomized control trials um, wave that we have seen in the past 20 years. Uh, we have seen uh, lots of evaluations coming out, particularly in Latin America, where I come from, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I could mention here the transfer project, and within the transfer project that was basically led by, by UNICEF, but also the FAO component that was looking from protection to production, that looked at the productive uh, impacts of social protection. So one of the key questions that came out of this um, research was basically whether social protection could for itself, without being linked, without being part of a strategy, have productive effects. So I think that the evidence in Latin America and, and in Africa actually shows that even if it's not integrated, social protection usually has an impact on both on agricultural production, because people invest part of this regular income that they receive. Of course, it depends a bit on the design, so the transfer needs to be regular. And here I would like to pinpoint that there is some evidence in coming out now from the Give Directly project, for example, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, showing that actually there is not much difference around investment grants and large lump sums and the regular transfers in terms of these impacts. So households that are receiving the cash transfers, they are both increasing their consumption, they're improving their food, and food security and nutrition um, within certain limits, because it's not like the, the only solution for that. There are uh, shortcomings uh, for, for, for the type of uh, impacts that we see, but they are also uh, investing in, in assets and investing in the productions. But one thing that's clear, that's very interesting is even for cash transfer programs that are targeted towards uh, labor constrained households, uh, we found some productive impacts because people are able to hire labor to work in their lands, even if it's a small land, even if it's just for self-consumption. 
So social protection has um, many um, uh, interesting impacts that have been clearly documented. But is this enough to eradicate poverty? Is this enough to ensure food security? I don't think so. No. But I'm saying that basically because usually we say that social protection, if, if well designed, with, if, it's something that it's always conditional social protection, but social protection, even if not, has these has this impacts. But if we manage to put it with an integrated strategy, it can have even higher impacts. So the challenge here is actually to think what are the cash plans or what are the complementary programs that we need to have in order to make it more sustainable in the sense that it can have, it can have more impacts in terms of the food security and increasing access to markets. So basically like the theoretical framework of the, of, of, of the theory of change around social protection is that it's going to have an impact at the household level by uh, uh, easing the credit or the liquidity constraints that the families have to make investments, given this uh, cash flow. But the cash flow wouldn't be enough. So there may be other constraints for the families. It may be access to markets, it may be that they don't have enough roads close to them. It may be collective action that's missing that has already been cited here. So the link is also, is also not only from the social protection side from the agricultural intervention and rural development, but also from the rural development side, the agricultural intervention towards the target population of social protection. And I'm saying that because usually the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Rural Development, do not see the poorest and the most vulnerable in rural areas as their target population. Sure. So they shouldn't profit from their problems. And here's another big challenge that we didn't mention yet, but it's quite important, is in the sense that these ministries think that they shouldn't um, design programs and policies and provide service to this population. So what end up happening? It ends up happening that the ministries that are taking care of social assistance, of social protection, and end up internally developing like substitute programs for the programs that these people should be having access in a, in a broader government okay. strategy. So I'd just like to, to finalize with okay. this, the importance of having uh, better integration and cooperation across ministries and also having the Ministry of Agriculture adapting their service to this population. Thank yeah, you. No, it's nice to stress this point that uh, the social protection could be supportive for, for the other aspects of commercialization and, and nutrition as well. So Clara, last but not least, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us more about your, your emphasis and your work? Of course. Um, thank you, uh, Ken, for, for us having here and, and to all of you for sharing your, your perspectives. I am Clara Colina. I'm Program Manager for MasterCards Foundation uh, Rural and Agricultural Finance Learning Lab. We are the learning partner for their um, $180 million portfolio in financial inclusion for, for rural sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so in, in our experience uh, working with our partners uh, in the portfolio, commercialization and, and self-consumption of food production are definitely relevant uh, livelihood strategies for some and, and probably a large part of the smallholder households we work with, uh, but maybe not for all, uh, I think as, as some of you have been, been raising here. Um, so one of the big... Andrea, could you make this, this slide uh, full screen? Oh yeah, thank you. So 100 projects, um, I'll give you a bit of a, a bit of the context um, of how we came about what the graphic you're seeing on the screen. But one of the biggest steps forward that we've seen in the sector is reconceptualizing how we think about smallholder farmers and more broadly rural uh, households. So in the past, the understanding of rural clients when we started seven years ago with, with MasterCard Foundation, we were talking about smallholder farmers in terms of their land size, what they produce, or what they sold in the market. In the last few years, we've become a lot more sophisticated with uh, smallholder data, particularly thanks to uh, some of the data being collected from the field, from CGAP, for instance, with the national representative surveys um, that have revealed that rural households have rich financial uh, profiles and have a range of income sources. Um, everyone says to be a farmer, but when you actually go and look what the income sources look like, there's a diverse a range of incomes from labor, from entrepreneurship, uh, from selling uh, surplus, et cetera. And this informs the choices they make and the livelihood strategies they pursue. Um, but even with these advances, uh, we were still 
talking, the way we were understanding smallholder house walls was largely static. We were still characterizing smallholder farmers based on a snapshot of what their life looked, looked at a particular uh, moment in time. In reality, however, uh, rural households, like any households, are dynamic. And as they pursue goals, as they face different challenges over the course of, of their lives, uh, that livelihood strategy that they uh, pursue evolves. So the graphic you see here tries to map, map out this dynamism and differentiate between the different segments of smallholder farmers and, and rural households that we're seeing uh, in, the, in, the, in the field and how, uh, what transitions may look like as they pursue increased resilience and, and increased agency. So these transitions coalesce around four centers uh, of gravity. Um, so from left uh, to right, it would start with the first one, farming as a business. These are the smallholder households that remain in primary production. Um, so uh, as a smallholder farmer invests in, in, in expanding their farm, you could, cut, you could uh, progress from the very vulnerable subsistence farmer that you find there on the, on the, on the bottom left, uh, the farmers that are primarily uh, growing crops for food consumption, you could progress into becoming a bit of a more commercializing uh, farmer intensifying production and eventually into a medium or large uh, farm. Going one step to, uh, to the right, uh, some smallholder households may shift away from primary agriculture production and pursue an entrepreneurship-based livelihood strategy. They may focus on agricultural services, so they may become a veterinary service, an aggregator, a processor, or go into non-agricultural services. So transportation, running a local shop, setting a mobile uh, agent, um, a stand, etc. Um, eventually, these may also evolve into medium and, and large enterprises. One step further to the right, we find the rural labor. So households may still be farming but, and remain in rural areas, but focus more their livelihood strategy on employment that supports what's going on in the rural ecosystem. And this may be both agricultural and non-agricultural uh, labor or in both formal and informal. And just towards the, towards the right-hand side, um, facing uh, enough push and pull factors, uh, farmers may uh, migrate to urban areas and transition fully to non-rural livelihood um, activities. So to the question um, uh, that you were asking uh, before, what strategy is the most effective really depends on what household we are talking about. So for subsistence farmers, if we, fo if we focus on that number one there on the, on the bottom left, social protection is very relevant, right? Until they're able to move to a more sustainable livelihood strategy that may or may not be around farm commercialization. Um, and this, this rural pathway model can help us distinguish these households, uh, what their goals are, what their aspirations are in life, what are those enablers that they need to transition to the different uh, livelihood strategies that they want to pursue. Uh, and what are some of the, those inhibitors that we need to work on so that, so that they can improve their, their overall livelihood? You done? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, maybe we can go back to full screen of all the panelists. So, so we've had a whole range of different uh, inputs and suggestions here. And what I want to really get on the table, I, I, I sense quite some focus in the, in the group on Africa. Uh, although not exclusively, of course. But in, in one of the previous uh, discussions, you know, it was really brought up that in, in uh, South Asia, particularly in India, there is already a, a very large uh, social protection program of, uh, of uh, cash payments to farmers. And many of those farmers are, are really in what they call the ultra small, small scale farming. So 40% of the households with less than 0 0.05 hectares. Now, maybe Mario, I mean, I know in your Lancet paper on nutrition, I mean, you talk about smallholders as, as the farms below 50 hectares, I think. So I think, you know, let's get on the table that we're talking about such a different, diverse group. And for which types of these groups, and I mean, Clara alluded to it, which types of these works do we really think commercialization maybe can play a role? Uh, do you want me to, to comment, Ken? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay, so so no, just just a clarification. In our paper, we had under two hectares, and those were the small holders. And then we had from two to twenty, twenty to fifty. So we yeah. we, we we said that the medium scale farmers were, were probably uh, a better engine for for sustainable food production in our in our model. But you know, I'm 
I'm very interested in following some of the discussion uh, from the other participants. This is an area where, where we have a lot of hunches, I find, uh, of, of things that could be better and so on. But I find in many cases, the evidence, the evidence lacking. For example, where, how do we know, is there enough evidence to ascertain that being a, a rural laborer would be a better, a better livelihood choice than uh, being a smallholder farmer? Uh, and, and what typically happens in these households is that you get perhaps a couple of the extended family taking roles within agriculture or not, uh, and, and some others remain in, in the farm household. Sure. But, you know, I, I, I would love to, to know that. Also, for example, whether in, in the commercialization uh, pathways that Iris was mentioning, I would find very inter interesting if we could do something like, you know, some kind of a contract farming for vegetables to, intent to incentivize at least a, a secure market for smallholders uh, and so on. Because I, th I think that those are the, the key things that would actually diminish risk in the operation. Uh, Okay, so I mean, I've linked that to a question that's come in from Ndengwa, uh, who, who's actually asking, are we proposing that, that uh, or are you among you proposing that, that uh, forming cooperatives is, is then one way of, of, uh, of, of moving, if you like, towards uh, an opportunity here? And I think, Mario, as well, I think you highlight as well that if, the, you know, a two hectare farm, if we're talking about uh, vegetables, for instance, and people have irrigation, can be actually a very lucrative operation, of course. It's, uh, it's a lot to do with what's being produced and not just necessarily the size of the farm. Um, Iris or uh, Kwame, do you want to come in on this? I uh, asked the panelists, if you want to wave at me, uh, please do at some point if you think, no, you want to, to come in. Iris? Yes, um, uh, I'd like to add two things. One, one thing to the point of, of, of Mario and one thing to uh, one of the, the comments in, in the chat. But I think what we increasingly see, Mario, is that companies are looking, so companies know, right, that they're still facing, so if we look at cash crops like coffee and cocoa, they know that they're still working with farmers that, that are far below the living income line. And they have invested quite a bit in training, in certification, sometimes even in, in inputs, in, in access to finance, right? But if we look at the data, we know it's not enough. So uh, what we see is that there's increased interest to look in into new innovations like looking at their procurement, their ways of procurement. And I think what you're referring to is that contract farming is, is a different way of the, the buyer-supplier relationship. Um, and uh, as IDH, we're looking indeed into contract farming, but also uh, block farms, uh, nucleus yeah. farms with block farm uh, with uh, contract farms. But what we also see is that uh, there is also a need for more radical change in those in the procurement relationship, where also they look at the payment terms, they look at. Uh, costs plus margin contracts. They look at what's called uh, clean sheeting. So looking at what is the ad, what's the value right created and who how is that value being uh, distributed. So I think there's lots more uh, to do with the, the the companies that are front runners in innovating uh, in the supplier buyer uh, relationship. Yeah, those those are fa fantastic options. Uh, we need more of that, definitely. So we're talking here again about about some of the crops which have maybe a better margin in terms of what the, the farmers can produce. I remember that uh, you're, you're very Museveni, uh, who's uh, a, a leader who's maybe lost some of his shine, used to say though that small farms should produce high value produce, we should produce low value produce, the staple crops on large farms. Kwame, where do you see this fitting in with your work around commercialization and this uh, new group of emergent farmers, for instance, in Africa? Um, can, can, I think the, um, there is some value um, in that if small farms could be tapped to produce some of those uh, products. 
So, um, for example, you, when, when you think about the issue of mechanization and um, products that are amenable to mechanization, so um, things like maize are very amenable to, uh, to, to mechanization, whereas when it comes to fruits and vegetables and horticulture, they are not readily amenable to mechanization. And those are things that I believe smallholders um, could uh, produce. Um, but the issue had always got, got to do with the volume that they will be able to produce, um, whether that is enough to be able to supply what those um, buyers will need. And that is where um, I've seen some companies use these outgrower schemes as a way to be able to procure the volumes that um, they need. Um, but I would also want to um, say that there is, um, we, we typically also think of these as small and medium as, as um, a dichotomy, but, but I think there is something that um, it, it is more of a continuum and there is to understand some complementary relationship between, uh, between them. And some of the studies that we have done um, indicates that in areas where you even have small, we have large, we have medium scale um, farms growing, those areas um, tend to have better access to market because, far, uh, because um, buyers come into those areas trying to procure products from these medium scale farms because of that, those large volumes. And while they are there, they also purchase goods from small scale farmers. Those medium scale farmers are also able to, um, to buy tractors or other mechanized inputs. And when those are not being used on their farms, small scale farmers also benefit from that. So I do not foresee the continent just having just small scale farmers or medium scale farmers. There is a continuum between um, those two and will most likely um, have food security uh, um, being achieved by supporting both uh, sizes of farms. Well, thanks very much. And, and I think, yeah, really interesting points about the interdependence, I think, mm -hmm. of farms. I mean, it's great, the chat, I keep looking at the chat panelists. I mean, it's, it's sort of exploding, it's a bit hard to follow. I wanted to pick up, while we're on this commercialization thing, just a, a couple of points that I, I, I picked up on. There's one here from uh, uh, Kamfak Ursil from Cameroon. How realistic is it to think that the private sector, particularly working in cash crops, so this is really coming back to you, Iris, I think, would effectively support smallholder farmers, knowing that that could reduce their dependency and put the private company's supply at risk? Would you see it like that? So yes, are the companies able to, to invest in the very smaller of the small farms? I think that's what he's driving at. Yes, so, so, so I think um, I was trying to, to answer it actually in the chat, which is almost impossible. So I admire you, Ken, that you moderate and read at the same time. I'm, I'm not good in that. Um, <laughs> But, but I think what we see is that uh, in some sectors, the companies don't have a lot of choice, right? So it's either supporting farmers uh, on, on their farm and at times also, right, with their off-farm activities. So to make sure that they're able to invest in their farms uh, while having the risk, right, because the risk is there that maybe some of the other crops or activities are more profitable, more interesting for farmers, so they may stop farming uh, certain crops. But I think the risk of not uh, getting into action is even larger than the risk that farmers may deviate some of their time and investments uh, to, to other crops. Yeah. So, so uh, I would say that that's, that's what we see. And if you say, uh, what about really the smaller farmers? Uh, we know that for, for some crops, right, that they're mostly produced really by small small farmers. And sure. uh, we do see some companies taking also creating plan B's, right, where they are setting up their own large farms, starting to work with uh, in, in, in a nucleus farm and working with uh, um, contract farmers. It's a bit what uh, Kwame was saying about sort of nucleus farms. I suppose I was driving a bit at this point that, that we often see what they call this Pareto principle, that 80% of of uh, uh, the twenty percent of the farmers produce eighty percent of the produce, or eighty percent of, of uh, 
the produce is produced by 20% of the farmers. And, and I think very often we see it's even more skewed, you know, 10% of the farmers producing 90% of the, of the produce. But Iris, you earlier were talking about the need for diversification. I'd like to bring this over to uh, Namugolo because we've heard about diversification, I think, in two different directions. One is that, that households do many different things in terms of crops. But also Mario is pointing out that we have household members who are also doing different things. So working away in the city and maybe coming back, the connection. But how does this link then to, to this idea of producing a nutritious food basket, do you think? So I think uh, just quickly to say that I, I'm a senior research coordinator for uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute, specifically on the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program. I forgot to introduce myself when I first spoke. Um, but in terms of uh, the issue of diversification of production and, and linking that to consumption patterns and, and, and nutrition, what we know for sure is that we, from uh, government programs and uh, investments, we've paid a lot more attention to staple uh, foods and not so much to nutrient dense foods. And yeah. so the value chain developments on nutrient dense foods has been extremely limited. And the fact that the production would be more predominantly from small scale farmers who are scattered all over the country, then you find the fact that the kind of investments that you require, things like roads, um, access to water and that kind of stuff has actually been very limited. Having said that, in places where programs have promoted diversification to impact nutrition, what we also find is that not enough attention has been paid to uh, providing nutrition education. And so the farmers will produce eggs, but they will sell all their eggs to purchase sugar um, and, and, and other things. So you might get smallholder farmers now producing what looks like a diverse basket, at least a more diverse nutrient basket for the household. But in actual fact, they are not benefiting as they should to that because they are looking at it as a cash producer and not necessarily for food to augment their nutritional needs. So that aspect must be addressed. Otherwise, the diversification um, work does not help. The income from people coming from outside, it's very clear it helps, but again, it falls under the same category of will you use the income to provide a more nutrient-based basket for your household or will you use the additional uh, income for other things? And we have to always keep in mind that there are other needs other than just foods that people have. Thank you. I see Mario wanted to come in. I just say, I remember, Noakolo, you were also mentioning yourself though that we shouldn't think about uh, farmers uh, or households, rural households, only consuming what they produce. We need to have a market actually providing the additional foods for them as well, so local markets for them to purchase food. And I thought that was an important point that is often under the table. Mario, you wanted to comment and then... Yeah, I, want, I wanted to pick on what Namukolo was saying and, and make some comments on diversification. Uh, probably another thing that we don't do often is to elevate the, you know, ele elevate the unit of analysis to the landscape when we talk about smallholder farmers. Uh, that, would, that might be really important to pick a lot of the added benefits of of having diverse and small farms. For example, if you go to many of the locations where, where, where we've worked traditionally, you see the big, the really, really big farms, just monocrops and, you know, probably with less biodiversity, less, uh, you know, protecting watersheds, way less and so on. But if you look at this very diverse landscapes with more trees, with more, uh, more probably more pollinating services uh, and a range of other benefits. Uh, that would be another case for uh, for adding, uh, you, you know, probably new sets of payments for for this for these smallholder farms. 
I think that we, we're talking here in this discussion very much about a productivity and nutrition side. Uh, but, but, you know, there's this other landscape dimension where we really need to, need to think of, well, what is the arrangement of the, of the landscape for producing the multiple benefits that we're trying to, to achieve as, as society, uh, dealing with climate change and dealing with, with, with all these other things. So, Mar can, I, can I respond uh, again? Because Please. I think it's, it's a really interesting point, right? And I, I think this is also something that we're looking into. So what are the opportunities for, for payments for ecosystem services for, for smallholder farmers, right? As, as they often have those far more diverse uh, uh, farming systems, uh, what would be needed uh, both uh, also at a regulatory level to... Um, to be able to make sure, right, that uh, those companies that are either offsetting or insetting their carbon footprints and, and, and are willing or are obligated to pay for this, uh, how to get such payments uh, to, to smallholder farmers. And it would be very interesting, right, to, to also look into uh, what then can be done, for example, with digital identities. And I would be keen to, for example, understand from Fabio, when you talk about social protection and digital identities, um, could we, for example, create a link, right, between payment for ecosystem services, digital identities, and social uh, protection? Great. So, Fabio, we've got an entry point for you in the discussion, I think, which is a great timing. I just wanted to say, though, as, as you talk about this idea of, of digital identities, and don't forget to unmute yourself, um, the... We were talking earlier about this role of different household members, and I was thinking a bit beyond, you know, to what extent there's some of this sort of, we could call social protection, but maybe the broader social safety nets. Also rely on the diversity of household members and their linkages to the city, or even the diaspora outside the country, which we know is a major flow of money into, com into countries. But maybe you could, uh, you could respond a bit to Iris's uh, uh, question, uh, Fabio. You're still on mute, by the way. Yeah. yeah okay. I have some noise behind me in the flat, yeah. in the neighbor. Oh, okay. Um, so on digital identity, um, uh, actually one of the, I would say, positive externalities of these um, large expansion of social cash trusts, both in Latin America and also in in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and more limited in Asia was the technology, technological development that came with it, with the adoption of social registries of this integrated database and innovative ways to pay the benefits, which include the bancarization of access to financial products for many of the beneficiaries of cash transfers. So in, in principle, in theory, that would allow uh, the social protection program or the social assistance to be better linked with uh, other programs. So it can be on the, on the health sector, it can be on the education sector, but it also could be on the more productive sector. So like the Ministry of Agriculture, the registry or potential registry for smallholder farmers or access to platforms to sell their products. So all these could be linked with the digitalization or the identification of these beneficiaries. Um, whether this has been successful or not, uh, I think that the evidence is not out there yet uh, because we still lack a little bit of coordination and coherence, uh, not only within the social protection sector as a whole, but also uh, between the social protection sector and the, the other sectors. So I think that's actually an area of research. It's an entry point to improve the coherence and the coordination across sector but it's still, it's still a little bit incipient. I think that the COVID-19 crisis and the response or the social protection response that governments has given, gave a boost to that. Um, so I hope that in the future, it, governments will be able to explore more these technological innovations that would allow them to have access to this uncovered population. So we've been, I'm coming to you, Clara, just now. Um, Fabio, we've, we've been talking though about this idea of targeting social protection and the like, but what about this, this idea of the, the, uh, the ultra basic uh, universal basic income? I mean, the, the Banerjee and the flow idea that we simply put in a foundation there across the world and give people the basic needs so that then they can build their livelihoods. Okay. 
Okay, the ultra base income or the basic income. So again, um, I think there are two aspects to it. I, I think that um, where it would be most needed, it's less discussed. So it's basically a discussion that, especially uh, around the COVID-19, it came in developed countries and in the high income developing countries. So like in Brazil, we are having this discussion now again. In Colombia, in Chile, the discussion picked up. But I don't see this discussion coming strongly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, whether it would be a good idea, um, possibly yes, possibly it could replace some of the subsidies that we have. And the fact that it's universal, it would make the political economy of the, subs of the subsidy reform easier to deal with. Because in most cases, and we have seen riots elsewhere in the world, when you come up with the idea of uh, taking off these, uh, the universal subsidies uh, and then moving towards more targeted safety net programs, you ended up having a political blockage in order to do that. So I think that this discussion can actually move some of the barriers around uh, this, uh, this discussion. But again, the whole issue of improving coherence and making coordination would still be there. And you would need to register the people for them to have access to. They would need to be paid. So they would need to have access to, to banks or to the ATMs. The ID, the digital ID would be available. And that could also be an entry point to link to more productive and agricultural interventions reaching them. No, thanks very much. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's something that got picked up, if you like, in developed countries around the whole COVID issue. And yet it's really a discussion that probably needs to be played much more broadly. Clara, sorry, I'm coming to you now. But uh -huh. There's been a huge interest in your in your pathways diagram in, in the chat, and let's take some of those comments. But for the remaining discussion, we've got about 20 minutes max left. I mean, in a sense, our challenge is to think about this whole idea of transformation. What are the pathways for transformation? So if I can challenge the, all of the panelists to think in that way. But anyway, Clara, over to you. Yeah, just wanted to build a bit on, on what Fabio was saying. We have building of the pathways um, graphic that I shared uh, before. For the last six months, we have been conducting human-centered design and, and primary um, survey data in Kenya to really go deep and, and understand the profile of these different segments that you saw on, on that graphic. And interestingly, I mean, it, it doesn't come as a surprise, but what we're seeing is like most of these households lack public social protection schemes uh, for those subsistence farmers that primarily farm uh, for food for family um, consumption. The, the national insurance is, is, is below 25%. It increases a bit uh, to 45% for those that are commercializing, but it's still fairly uh, fairly low and, 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 and a lack of access across uh, pathways. Interestingly, what we've seen from our portfolio and increasing and, and with COVID especially is how private sector providers are coming in and trying to provide the resilience buffer that you would normally um, ask from a public social protection scheme. Um, so for instance, we've seen uh, providers trying to bundle insurance um, agriculture, but also life insurance um, into inputs uh, bundles, uh, such as AK Africa. We've seen other providers such as uh, in COPA, which is a pay-as-you-go uh, solar with, with the COVID crisis, has actually been providing a living wage uh, in the form of, of a loan to be repaid uh, from, future, uh, from future sales. Uh, and this loan includes health insurance, hospital coverage for workers and, and families. Um, 100% of a cover for, for around 12, 12 weeks. Um, so we're seeing this, uh, some initiatives from the private sector that are trying to, uh, to build that resilience uh, buffer. And in the absence of, of social protection, and I'm not sure who is, had mentioned this before, I think maybe it was, it was, it was Fabio uh, or, or Felix, I, I can't remember, but in the absence of social protection with a public or, or private, the flexible repayment schedule of loan products has been proved uh, crucial within a portfolio to really take some of that pressure of, of households in times of financial uh, stress. Uh, so again, we have multiple examples um, within uh, the MasterCard portfolio of flexible repayments uh, that allow farmers to better manage these, these cash flows, uh, especially when, when it's, it's to purchase inputs, whether that's uh, to pay school fees or that is to make a, to try to face a, a family emergency. 
So it's encouraging to see a bit of a private sector uh, innovative ways of trying to, to build that resilience. Okay, so I, there are a couple of points I, I picked up from the from the chat I'd like to bring in. I mean, one is uh, uh, Dominic Glover is asking, actually asking, you know, if we think about these farmers in these different sort of steps in a pathway, are we not actually ignoring the fact that actually um, self can, self uh, production, self consumption can remain a very important part of their safety net, even though they might be moving moving forward. And there was another comment I can't I can't see it back now, which was saying, you know, uh, the fear, if you like, of people fleeing uh, rural areas for the city. And so th this, you know, this whole idea of alternatives in terms of alternative employment, which can be a complement and not necessarily a substitute as well. So I mean. I'm looking maybe at, at those who haven't had a chance to chat for a minute, so Kwame or others, if you if you want to come in on this, or or Clara. Yeah, absolutely. I think those those two are very very valid uh, points. I think self consumption for the majority of this households that we are seeing, even if they technically fall in a different pathway, based on on one what they. Uh, what they describe the main goal to be, to uh, either expand their farm or they consider farm as a business or they actually want to pursue labor as well as where the main income is, uh, is coming from. Over 90% uh, of these households actually farm in some uh, form or shape, uh, even if it's just for family uh, consumption. So they still, they are still smallholder farmers, even if they're pursuing uh, multiple goals um, multiple goals at the same time. In terms of the of the labor, I think also Mario brought it uh, earlier on this conversation. That's a really tricky question in terms of whether the labor is actually better than than being a smallholder farmer. And when we've tried to look at this data on, on several indicators, whether that's income and, and other socioeconomic indicators, there's labor is, is spans a huge range in the in the resilience uh, ladder, right? And there is very precarious labor that that is that is almost as you know as uh, the livelihood is as 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 bad as as a subsistence uh, farmer, right? Um, and so it definitely spans. What we're seeing, especially from a lot of, of funders, including Massacre Foundation, who, as you may all, all know, has shifted uh, the strategy quite a bit into employment, is how can we create vibrant rural ecosystems uh, which actually which actually employ a, a, a lot of this a, a lot of this smallholder households and prevent the large inflow into urban cities that ultimately is unsustainable. Uh, so this is where a lot of the activities spoken uh, focusing on today. How one can create this vibrant ecosystem and that provide both agricultural but also non-agricultural services and attract a lot of the young uh, people to work on this new uh, industry while remaining in rural areas and while doing some farming on the side. Not so, easy. Yeah, so, so can... I'm um, going to give Kwame the, the floor first and then uh, Fabio and Marius, yeah? Okay, so, so, so Ken, I, I, I still think that self-consumption uh, is an important piece to meeting those full security needs, but again, it's important to pay attention to what these smallholder farmers are producing on their farm and whether, um, whether they are producing the right mix of products that will ensure that they, um, they meet their nutrition needs. And, and I think one area of incentivizing this is um, through government policies. Um, you typically have these government policies where government is encouraging um, certain, we have certain priority crops. So, so, so for example, we have the planting for food and jobs in Ghana. Um, which had five main priority crops, so that rice, sorghum, um, and then it also includes vegetables, right? So with that as priority crops, farmers, it, it, it gives signal and encourage these farmers to be able to produce that because they're able to get the support when, 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 when they do that. But I also want to um, say that the fact that you have food in the house, nutritious food in the house, does not mean that each person in the household is actually receiving the nutrition that is needed. And so we need to also pay attention to some of the intra-household dynamics um, that influences the allocation of food within, within, the, uh, within the household. And I want to touch a little bit on also on the social protection with, with respect to the issue of targeting. 
that often we have um, an, a number of these tends to be centralized and uh, we go in, you take, you use mean test to, to select the sample of those that you are going to support. Um, but the livelihood of, of these individuals tend to be very dynamic. One shock could push other, um, could push one household into extreme poverty who may not necessarily be part of um, the original sample. And those people may not be able to receive benefits uh, uh, when it's needed. So I think maybe a better approach to think about it is to decentralize these approaches and adopt some kind of a community-based targeting, which could also be complemented with a mean-based targeting. Those within the communities know the person whose, whose farm just got burned or the person who is not able to sustain themselves. And they will be able to respond in a more timely manner to those needs to prevent much of those households um, falling back into poverty. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, I think Fabio and, and um, Mario both wanted uh, to speak. Mario, uh, Fabio first. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, two comments um, regarding how social protection touch up on some of these um, issues that we discussed. So in terms of um, guaranteeing a market for smallholder farmers in order to incentivize them to produce more vegetables uh, and diversify their production. Uh, so I was wondering here a little bit about the P4P initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and also the PAA uh, that was linked actually to these three school feeding programs. So I don't think that we have, we managed to build much evidence around this. And I think it's still worth trying to figure out how the provision of school feeding and the purchasing of school feeding uh, from smallholder farmers in a diversified way so that you don't buy only cereal. So most examples that we have actually are based on stable crops. Um, not really like rich vegetables to provide to, to the schools uh, could serve. So that's usually uh, also classified as social protection, the, the school feeding program. So the how home grow is school feeding within a local catchment area of the schools uh, could better or couldn't be uh, an instrument to incentivize uh, the production of these more diversified uh, foods, especially vegetables and also improved food and nutrition of the smallholder farmer families and not only of the school children. The, the other aspect that I, could, I, I would like to mention is the, the whole idea of the targeting that Felix was mentioning. Uh, but actually the social cash transfer pilots that we had in the early 2000s in Sub-Saharan Africa, they started with the community-based targeting. But here the idea was basically uh, to target the ultra poor. So the 10% poorest, it's, it's known in the literature as the 10% model. So basically the idea that those who could not provide for themselves would get the cash transfer. So it's a little bit different from the idea of being a flexible mechanism that could mend the, the pitfalls or the shortcomings of a proxy means testing. That's the model that, for example, the World Bank has incentivized uh, worldwide and also, also in Africa, where the community base just comes at the end to validate the people that had been selected by, by the model. But usually this model, they, they are basically sort of uh, predicting uh, chronic poverty. So they are not able to actually predict those who are more vulnerable, that when there is a shock, when there is a, 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 a drought or there is a flood, they need this support and they, they can have it. So I think that the hunger uh, safety net program in Kenya is one of the few examples on how at least for natural shocks, uh, um, the social protection has been adapted to, to do it. But I, I don't uh, think that necessarily the community-based target would be able uh, to respond to it. It's one of the models, but I don't think that at the scale that's needed when a shock happens, it would be enough uh, to, to actually accommodate all the number of beneficiaries, especially with the budget. So you need to have a contingency funds, government-led, not donor-led, to, to, to incorporate the new beneficiaries, which would be a challenge for most countries. I've got Mario and Namukolo wants to come in as well. So Mario. Oh, I, I, want to, I want to go back to the intra-household dynamics. Uh, while, while, for example, uh, sons and daughters moving to, 
to cities for better employment is a really a positive thing because it, it gives the extended family more resources, more cash, and, and a range of other things. It is also probably uh, a good uh, deterrent to, uh, to consolidation because then people will actually maintain the, the small farms, but probably as, as less productive farms and not necessarily uh, trying to make a living of them, especially if the off-farm incomes become really important. So this raises another, ta another question, which is, which are the farmers that we really need to be targeting for development activities? You know, because you could argue that the farms that have a lot of the off-farm income are no longer the farms that will actually have heavy investments in improving food production and so on. So uh, this, this, this is a, a, an important empirical question that we need to solve to really spend the dollars wise, the, the development and research dollars wisely. And I guess the answer is, Marius, it depends, yeah? But anyway, that... <laughs> because it'll be different for different households in different places, of course. Now, yeah, Nicola, of course. and maybe yes, you can comment um... as well around, you, you, you had an answer in the chat, which was very much about education and diets and things, because obviously we can have food available. It doesn't mean that people are necessarily still going to choose the correct diet, does it? But anyway, yes. So, so that is actually a challenge in terms of um, not just smallholder farmers and poor um, households, but even as they become more affluent and have higher incomes, uh, we then continue. In fact, our aspirations are not always for a better diet a more healthy diet. Our aspirations are for McDonald's and that kind of stuff. And so we, we have this uh, almost like a complex situation that we need to deal with, that while we are promoting diversification of production, we need to include activities such as nutrition education and others that ensure that the additional diversification that we accrue actually has a positive impact on nutrition and health outcomes. And that's an area that we often uh, actually f forget about. But in addition to that, I, I really like the model that Clara shared um, because it gives a uh, provision for different uh, entry points for different people to have different aspirations. Uh, that is great. So the idea of developing a, a, a rural vibrant ecosystem is great. Um, the, the, what I would suggest is we also need uh, similar vibrant ecosystems for peri-urban areas as well. Um, and that that's where government investment can actually help us is in creating an enabling environment for those vibrant ecosystems to actually develop. And then of course, from a nutrition perspective, it must come with additional uh, information to make, make sure that the vibrance does also impact nutrition uh, positively. So I really think uh, the model plus this vibrancy of an ecosystem being developed might be useful entry points for uh, looking into uh, towards developing uh, food systems that can actually deliver for nutrition in our settings. Social protection, great. One of the problems with social protection, Fabio, on the African continent is simply because it's been so dependent on donor funding that politicians are actually sometimes scared to, pro to promise anything because you promise social protection. If it doesn't come, you get riots, but your fiscal environment is such that you are not able to provide. So it's a double-edged sword in some situations. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. John Mopangwa is just challenging us that we're talking only about crop production, but we know particularly in Africa, smallholder farming is entwined with the role of livestock as well, uh, which also have a very important role in human nutrition. So it's something we should remember. Guys, uh, we're going to have to move towards right winding up, winding up, but I, I just want to throw one more bomb into the, into the mix, which is this whole issue of demography in Africa and the fact that we're 
dealing with a situation where population is, is still exploding. We're going to have double the number of people by 2050, four times as many people almost by the end of the century. And, and that's going to put another huge pressure on the transformation of these systems. I think, you know, Namukelo, you, you just introduced and, and emphasized particularly the role of the, of the public sector as well. We've heard quite a bit about the, the role of the private sector already. What about this role of, of uh, the increasing pressure in rural areas? Does anybody want to speak to that? Or is that just too difficult? I don't see any pun The increasing what? The increasing population pressure, Namukolo. The fact that the populations, you, know, you mentioned you're in Ethiopia. I remember I used to think of the population as 80 million. It's now 120 million. I mean, it's going so <laughs> Close quickly. to 120 millions. They caught anywhere for 110 to 120. The population pressure in the rural area is there. Um, I think the situation differs slightly depending on countries and the availability of arable lands. Um, but that population pressure on the rural areas is also contributing to the migration to urban centers to look for livelihoods. So it's a combination of things that are there. That is one of the reasons why I like the idea of promoting development of these vibrant ecosystems in the rural setting, in the peri-urban setting, because that provides another uh, attraction that people will have something else to do besides migrating to the urban center. Um, but we're definitely not paying enough attention. I really strongly believe that from a government, if you look at African people, they're very creative. I mean, the pandemic has taught us something in that while people were crying about PPEs coming from China, a lot of African people developed small scale enterprises and started producing things. Whether they were effective or not is a different issue. But the point is there's a lot of creativity when people are given opportunities and entry points to do something they actually try. So creating an, enable, an enabling environment for these vibrant ecosystems to develop to me is something that governments, the public sector in particular, needs to look into because the private sector can actually leverage that and, and, and roll things in their favor. Thank you. Thanks very much okay. indeed. I'm going to bring Jim. You must be there still. I'm going to invite you in to, to wind up. Um, but Kwame first, the last comment. Okay, so I, I, I think um, Namkola um, just was spot on uh, with that. I just want to also add that there are some challenges that this growing population poses, like you talk about the issue with land scarcity. But um, I also think that, you know, in, in addition to creating that ecosystem outside of the outside um, in the off farm sector, um, there is also it's also very important to also increase agricultural productivity from a structure transformation perspective, uh, because the off farm sector growth depends largely on the agricultural um, sector. So you could only get labor to exit from agriculture mm -hmm. into the off-farm sector if agriculture is productive enough to generate the income that will demand food and uh, that will demand off-farm goods and services. And um, I, I'm quick to point out that the, um, the premise for supporting smallholder farmers is not to keep people in smallholder farming, but it's to also help, help free up labor and create that multiplier effect in the off-farm sure. sector, that will create more jobs for but They have people. to go hand in hand. It yeah. has to go yeah. hand, hand in hand. Yeah. And I on the time, we've got to close pretty soon. So I'm gonna hand over to Jim to just to summarize the whole of our discussion. <laughs> Ken, thank you very much. And thank you to our panelists. What an unbelievably rich discussion, full of fantastic insights. I've been trying to sort of take some notes here and my brain is sort of almost exploding a little bit, but uh, fantastic. Uh, Ken, you sort of failed to come to the last question, which was, do we need a fundamentally different narrative uh, on how to improve small-scale farming households? And I think in, in many ways, our panellists have, have answered that very well in actually giving us a whole range of elements that need to, need to come together and, and, and just in, even through this discussion have actually opened up that very different sort of narrative. 
I guess two two big ideas sort of strike me from the discussion. The first one of, is you know, maybe common sense, but it's this need for a much more holistic perspective on the sort of issues we're talking about. But aligned with that, um, I think diversification has been a critical uh, theme that has, has come through, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I mean, alongside these things, I think a few really interesting points. Um, the importance of understanding the sort of deeper structural changes that are happening in multiple dimensions and how they're actually flowing into what's happening for house, uh, farming households. The incredible diversification that's going on in, in farming households that we can no longer really separate farming households from wider economy and wider issues. Um, I think a, an interesting warning about self-consumption and recognizing that you know, a household needs to have a diversity of uh, nutrition at the right times in the year and that you can't expect that to come from people's own plots necessarily. So again, a real integration in that. Um, I think a lot of emphasis on the importance of different sorts of social protection and particularly the critical role of social insurance but the whole social insurance, the social protection needs to sit within a wider framework of complementary services, whether it's infrastructure, social mobilization, education, and so on. So again, you can't, you can't split that, that out. Um, around the diversification, I think we've sort of covered maybe four areas. One is that diversification of life, um, Household livelihoods is absolutely critical. that you can't manage to tackle small scale agriculture issues only through farming. Secondly, the need to dramatically diversify, diversify um, different types of food production for our nutritional requirements. The need to diversify how we understand farming in terms of looking at other services, whether it's uh, in tackling climate change or tackling ecosystem services. And, and the need for a much more diversified set of support strategies to tackle um, the challenges still faced by uh, farming households. I think the discussions also come back to a really interesting point that we had from the Latin America discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago, was about the need to understand how wider societal challenges link to the challenges of small scale farmers and see them as a solution to society's wider problems rather than themselves being a, being a problem. So I think the whole discussion we've had around you know, how, how do you get a diversified diet from what smallholders are producing? How do you avoid mass migration rapidly to urban areas? How do you provide ecosystem services? How do you look at the role of farming in tackling the climate crisis? All of these issues, I think, bring us a totally different perspective on how we can value what it is that the small scale farming community has to offer society at large. I think within all that, everybody has been highlighting the critical need to get a much more nuanced understanding about what's happening to who, where and why. Um, and that that can perhaps enable us to have an understanding of who's on a pathway towards sort of greater prosperity and who's not, and consequently who needs what sort of support in what sorts of, of areas. And then I think, you know, we've really highlighted that we're lacking some of that nuanced understanding. And I think illustrated by Clara about how important that sort of research is in, in unpacking that. And I think from my perspective, uh, all of that brings us back to thinking about the role of the Food System Summit and what we perhaps need to be doing in having far more detailed sort of small scale farming transition strategies at a national level that really try to unpack what's going on at a national level at a local level and what that means for a much more innovative set of, of policies and mechanisms to support what has to be a, a fairly fundamental transition. Um, so thank you everybody very much. Thank you, thank you, Ken. We'll be trying to wrap all of this up. We'll be making this fabulous conversation into a podcast for others to, to listen to. And we look forward to an ongoing sort of engagement and dialogue around this. Ken, back to you. Well, yeah, just, just uh, very much to finish off. Thanks indeed to everybody uh, on the panel who, who contributed today. Really great uh, inputs. Also to all of the different inputs we've had in the, in the chats, which we'll uh, make available. We're, our last session is on the 25th of November of this series, where we'll be looking more at uh, issues around policy and how we try and bring that together. And if you've got suggestions for that, then please do get in touch with us. Uh, thanks very much again. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.